speaker. Um, I'm uh, ready to retire, and uh, therefore uh, will yield back. The gentleman yields back. Under the speaker's announced policy of January 5th, 2011, the chair recognizes a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In uh, the summer of 1973, it was a real honor for me to be selected to go on an exchange program. Of course, I had to borrow the money to go and had to pay that back by working hard and uh, taking care of the loan. But um, went on an exchange program in the Soviet Union, 1973, that summer. It was quite an eye-opener for me. Um, Despite how wonderful the country was made to sound and how great it was that the government, uh, they proclaimed, uh, was the safety net for everybody in the country, and they're proclaiming that because the government was in charge of everything and in charge of everybody's business, uh, there was 100% employment. Uh, they talked about how wonderful their socialized medicine was. Um, there were eight Americans on this program that were allowed into the Soviet Union that summer, and we all had very different backgrounds, uh, different political views, um, a lot of big hearts in the group on both ends of the political spectrum. But for me, kid growing up in East Texas, it, it was an extraordinary education. Because even though people talked about how wonderful it was to have socialized medicine, everybody had a safety net, because the government was the safety net, that country's economic system was rotting from within. Went to medical school. It reminded me of uh, pictures from American medical schools from 40, 50 years before. We went to the uh, economic exhibition, kind of like a World's Fair in Moscow at one point. Um, and it reminded me of the pictures from a 1940 or early 1950s uh, World's Fair. You know, things like tractors sitting out there with people ooing and aahing over tractors. I'm going, good grief, uh, because I knew we didn't need a World's Fair to see tractors like that. You could go to any used tractor dealer and find tractors that nice in the U.S. But everybody was told how wonderful it was. And uh, during the course of the summer, uh, during the course of time down in Ukraine, um, I got to be good friends with a few of the students there. They were very standoffish at first. Um, I spoke some Russian back in those days, and, and they spoke better English than I did Russian. But uh, one guy in particular, he, he'd bring his dictionary with him and translate. And so, because both of us, you know, it, it's amazing you take a language course. I had two years of Russian at Texas A&M, and... Uh, you know, you were taught to converse about I'm um, going to the library and I have a dog and these kind of things. But when you want to talk about really serious life issues, uh, we weren't prepared for those things. And uh, so we needed a dictionary so we could get our ideas across. But at one point he said, you know, you, you seem surprised that our country wouldn't want better 
And he, he grabbed my shirt and he said, we don't have material this good. I just had a regular, you know, polo type shirt. He said, we don't have material this good for our individuals. But he said, you you know, we've, we fought two world wars on our soil. Um, and he said, we don't have it as good as you do in your country. That's obvious. He said, but people will always be reluctant to leave the best they've ever known for something they're not sure about. So uh, when we got to 1989 and the Soviet Union fell because of the economic uh, disease and decay, uh, that was pushed into the death spiral by uh, President Reagan's uh, actions, and followed by President George W. George H. W. Bush. Uh, it collapsed, and then we began to see all of the economic problems that were eating away at that country because the government tried to be the safety net for everything and everybody. And it won't work that way. At a collective farm out, way out from uh, Kiev, um, I was surprised. I've worked on farms and ranches, and you usually try to get your work done before uh, mid-afternoon when the sun gets its hottest, and that means you start early, start close to daybreak as you can, and mid-morning is prime time. And here was mid-morning, and, and these farmers were sitting around in the shade there uh, in the farming village, and I looked. I'd been looking out at these fields. You could hardly tell what was cultivated and what wasn't. It was. It, it looked terrible. Uh, they had some really nice gardens right around their individual um, little dwelling places. Yeah, those were kept up. Those they got to have for themselves. But the fields just didn't look good at all. And I, I tried to be nice and my best Russian I could. I, said, uh, when do you work out in the fields? And they kind of laughed. And one of them said in Russian, I make the same number of rubles if I'm here or if I'm out there, so I'm here. And boy, was that a lesson in why a big, huge, nothing but safety net country can't work. Free markets work until they decide it's time to be socialistic, progressive, whatever you want to call it. And so they go that way, and then, they, and then uh, free market forces fail because they've been taken over by progressive socialist structures. Now, it's, it's a good thought. I mean, it's a wonderful idea to think, gee, we'll just decree, as did the pilgrims, as did the early New Testament church, we'll just bring everything into a common storehouse and split, split it equally. Um, sounds like a great idea, but as the Apostle Paul found, as the pilgrims found, uh, eventually you have to say, you know what, this isn't working out very well. We're going to have to have some strict rules. The pilgrims found if you divide it up into private property and allowed people to eat what they grew, not only did they grow enough for themselves, but they actually would grow enough to use, trade, barter, sell, and that could be very effective. But I heard my friend um, across the aisle mentioning earlier about the so-called Ryan Voucher Care, and I know they know, in fairness to my friend Paul Ryan, it was great to see him on the floor this evening, um, that actually... Anybody over 55 gets Medicare. The Paul Ryan proposal, it's not exactly like the bill that I'd previously proposed, but, um, you know, my friend's brilliant. He's on the right track. And he says, you're over 55, you get Medicare. Now, I would go a step farther because I know what's being proposed for those under 55 is going to end up being so much better, giving control back to patients, getting a, a control back between the doctor and the patient instead of having an insurance company or the government between the patient and the doctor. But this business of safety net is clearly, they're not talking safety net, they're talking government takeover of everything. But Paul Ryan's plan would make sure that those under 55 
had health care and had it affordable. And so there are all kinds of reforms that need to be made. We did not need a full takeover of health care by the government. Um, my friend had mentioned that um, because we kept passing bills to repeal Obamacare, and actually uh, there were very few bills that dealt with a massive over uh, repeal of Obamacare, uh, but they, but there were many bills that picked out specific parts. Look, friends across the aisle, you surely don't want to be responsible for this terrible part of Obamacare. So when people go back and say, oh, you voted to repeal it 33 times, well, there were different aspects, and we couldn't even get our friends to vote to repeal parts that they knew once they found out after they passed it what was in it. We didn't even vote for things to be repealed that they knew would not be good. Um, my friend said that uh, basically the president called us here and asked us to pass his American Jobs Act, and I was so glad he brought that up. I would about forgotten about the American Jobs Act, the president's. He came and he stood right there, Madam Speaker, and he told us, I forget, 16, 17 times, pass my bill right now, right here, right now, over and over, he kept saying. And so I kept wanting to get a copy of the bill. He was chastising us for not passing it. Well, show, me, show it to me. Let me see it. So we kept calling the White House trying to get it. A week later, it was clear there was no bill. Um, so I figured, well, if there's no bill, and he keeps running around the country, spending all the taxpayer's money flying around on Air Force One, what sounded and looked like campaign stops, but, but uh, government paid for it all. So he's out there saying over and over and over, tell Congress pass my American Jobs Act, pass the American Jobs Act. He'd have banners, pass the American Jobs Act, American Jobs Act. I thought, well, good grief, he's going to keep telling us we need to pass the American Jobs Act. There really ought to be one. So I put a two-page bill together that would eliminate the 35% tariff that we put on all American-made goods here in America, all uh, made by any company in America, it's called a corporate tax, an insidious tax, because it, it deceives people into thinking that, gee, if you tax the evil old mean corporations, then we don't have to pay it. Baloney. If a corporation, a company doesn't pass that tax on to its customers, clients, uh, people buying its services, then they go out of business. That's how it works. 35% tax. Highest tariff that any company, a country in the world puts on its own goods, and we were doing that. So mine says, let's eliminate that. And we had heard from people you know, around the world, good gravy, if you just dropped your corporate tax 12%, manufacturing jobs would come flooding back into this company, country. You know, you want to talk about pro-union, I know this side of the aisle wants to see the government unit, unions grow more and more, and I never understand that. I understand retired government workers need a union because they don't have leverage of what, but, but to have government workers in a country where the government is the people. All of us that are elected here, we're public servants. Everybody that is hired by the federal government is supposed to be a government servant. We work for the people of America. Why in the world would you need a union to conspire against the people of America. Because obviously the, the role of any government union would be to get government bigger and bigger and more and more benefits to the detriment of those who are paying for all of that. So anyway, I, I don't understand why we needed federal government unions. Neither did Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, but that's where all this goes. And by the way, in the president's, when we eventually got a copy of the president's idea of a jobs act, we found, although he had been telling everybody in America he was only going to increase taxes on millionaires and billionaires, what he did was increase taxes on everybody that made over 125000 individually. Uh, he said he's going after big oil. He's going to end the giveaways to big oil. But when you looked at page around 130 or something, um, the pages that dealt with oil companies were not going to affect the big oil companies at all. 
But since 94, 95% of all the oil and gas wells in America are drilled and operated by independent oil companies run by Americans, uh, you look at what was eliminated, it was really only the things that were going to devastate the independent, some of them basically mom and pop type uh, uh, services that worked on oil wells, gas wells, it's going to shut them down. They wouldn't be able to afford business. It would eliminate the pass-through deduction for investing in wells. Well, if, if, if the independents can't get people to invest in the wells, they can't drill them. But the big oil companies, they don't have to get people to invest in oil wells. They've got enough money to do that. It was incredible. I couldn't believe it. I got it to uh, CPAs that do uh, work for independent oil and gas companies, small ones, and, and they were saying, oh, my word, if this goes into law, we'll be out of business. We can't stay in business. What does that do? It ends 94 95% of uh, the oil and gas wells in America. It also means that gasoline goes up even further than the doubling that this president's already done. Oh, wind energy. We heard about wind energy smart grid. Think about it. We've had these hearings in our natural energy or natural resources committee. Doc Hastings done a fabulous job. Amazing the stuff you find out. And what we found out even just this week, last week, uh, actually when you talk about using wind or solar energy, since wind doesn't blow all the time and sun doesn't shine all the time, and since we don't have an effective way to hold electricity, there's no massive battery that we've developed yet that holds significant amounts of electricity. So you have to use that electricity immediately because you can't hold it. When we get to the point where we have some way to hold electricity, then we're on our way. Then solar, wind, those things will be a whole lot more helpful. But as it is, if you declare we're going to have to have wind energy and we're going to have to use solar energy, then for those times when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining but people still need electricity, then you're going to have to have a coal power, uh, power plant. You're going to have to have gas, natural gas power plant, nuclear power plant. So you're going to have to have all of those things standing by to produce the energy when these other things don't. You're going to have to have different sets of wires taking electricity from the regular power plants and also send them out to the windmills way out wherever they are, uh, where they're out there chopping up endangered species, birds and all, and bring that electricity in. You're going to end up having to um, uh, have different wires going out to solar places. And then you're going to... So, Actually, you're going to be paying two and three times as much for energy because you have to have two to three times the infrastructure just so that you can say we're getting some of our power from wind and from um, sun. What it did was set up more government. You read the bill like I did, and yes, I'm anal enough. I read some of these stupid bills, including the president's idea of a jobs act. It created more government. It took over more control of the Internet. It took over more control of cable. It, it, was, it was just a disaster. So I, I hear about the president's great ideas for helping the economy, and I say, thank goodness the president didn't pass that disaster because the economy would be doing even far worse. Well, except for the people that suck out the, the millions and hundreds of millions and billions like the President's friends at Solyndra and things like that. And uh, by the way, I, I see today this article, uh, September 13, 2012, uh, AP reports weekly U.S. Job, jobless aid applications jumped to 382,000 by Christopher Christopher Rugeber. Um Anyway, jobless claims jump to a two-month high. Not exactly the progress the president says was happening. Um, I, I, I've been mentioning ever ever since I found out from Gold Star parents, uh, Billy and Karen Vaughn. They told me two-thirds of the deaths and the wounds. 
um, of our military in Afghanistan have occurred under President Obama. I couldn't believe that, so we got the official numbers. Got a poster around here somewhere. Uh, not time to use it right now, but uh, when we got the official numbers, it turns out 70 percent of those who have been killed in Afghanistan have been killed under President Obama's command, even though he's been in command in Afghanistan only half the time of President Bush. Eighty-four percent of those people losing arms, legs, hands, uh, terribly disabling wounds from IEDs and other injured injury uh, sources, 84 percent of those have occurred under Commander-in-Chief Obama compared to the 16 percent that occurred under President Bush in Afghanistan. Uh, article here from Breitbart by Tony Lee. On the somber 11th anniversary of 9-11 attacks, nearly 2,000 members of the U.S. military have died in Afghanistan since the war started in response to the attacks in 2011. And by the way, this President Obama, when he was running for president, called it the good war. But this article by Tony Lee goes on and points out what I've been talking about ever since uh, Billy and Karen brought that to my attention. And I was greatly sorry that I did not know that without them pointing it out to me. Uh, it was also interesting to read the article by John Nolte, uh, 12 September 2012. Um, <laughs> Obviously, I like the guy. I like his cynicism. He says, oh, that awful Mitt Romney. Just a few minutes before the White House itself disavowed the Cairo embassy apologizing for free speech, Romney rightfully condemned the appeasing statement in no uncertain terms. And as a result, all day long, the corrupt media has been on a rampage to make Romney pay for the unpardonable sin of criticizing their precious one. You see, there's no precedent for a political opponent immediately criticizing a sitting president after a foreign policy crisis. Oh, wait. And then it has a reference to other articles where that's gone on, uh, flashback to Kerry slamming Bush over and over it's happened when it's a Republican president. Uh, the article says, so with the entire institution of the media circling, circling wagons for Obama today, in a futile attempt to rescue him from his own foreign policy blunders, we now have CBS News riding to the rescue in order to give the same president who condemned Romney before he condemned the terrorists uh, an opportunity to further politicize this tragedy. Um, there's a broader lesson to be learned here. Governor Romney seems to have a tendency to shoot first and aim later. That's what President Obama had to say. Yes, that's President. That's President um, talking about spouting off too quickly, but the President is right about Mitt Romney, guilty as charged. Romney did shoot first to defend the principles of free speech that the people who worked for Obama in Cairo were so eager, eager to fritter away. Yes, and Mitt Romney saw this outrageous example of simpering into the face of terror coming from American officials and immediately spoke out against it. And it goes on to make the great point. Romney stood up for free speech. The movie that's been fussed about sounds like a ridiculous thing that should not be done, except that this is America, where people, whether it's Howard Stern or anybody else, they have a right to say things, no matter how offensive they may be, unless they go so far that they actually harm other people. Um, another article, no record of intel briefings for Obama week before embassy attacks. This was written by Winton Hall, uh, 12 September 2012 points out, according to the White House calendar, there's no public record of President Barack Obama attending his daily intelligence briefing, known as the Presidential Daily Brief, PDB, in the week leading up to the attacks on the U.S. Embassy in Cairo and the murder of U.S. Libyan Ambassador Chris Stevens and three American members of his staff. And, and I've, I've got to say, I, I, I read an account and a story and of 
the administration reporting the name of one of the other three killed as part of the Libyan uh, embassy personnel. They gave the man's name, pointed out he was a former SEAL team member, but was in private security force. And then, according to the article, the administration reported that he was killed while running for cover. Madam Speaker, I know something about SEAL team members. In the mind of a SEAL team member or a former SEAL team member, he is never running for cover. He's running for a place, if at all, from which to launch a better attack. Even in death, this administration can't be respectful to the people that have laid down their lives for this administration. And we, even though the White House says that, gee, the president does read briefings, he just doesn't, hadn't been getting them personally, um, I would hope that he would start doing that. There's people's lives at stake. And he is president. He's, he's such a fantastic campaigner. And I know it's inconvenient, but I sure hope that he'll get back to being president and to give credit where credit's due. It was very wonderful of the president to take a minute and a half or whatever it was, a minute, minute and a half, to pay tribute to those who laid down their lives for their country at the Libya embassy where they didn't have adequate security and where this administration enabled al-Qaeda and others to take over the government. It was nice of him to take a minute and a half to pay tribute to them giving their lives in the middle of his campaign event before he went on with um, the celebration. Uh, I recall President George W. Bush. People here know we certainly had our differences, and I certainly disagreed with him on a number of things. But I had great respect for the man. He said, how can I go play golf when I am commander-in-chief and I have sent soldiers, our military, into harm's way? It just doesn't feel right for me to be out on a golf course having a good time when our men and women are in harm's way. But it, it did look like a fun celebration there that President Obama was having in uh, Las Vegas. Another article, Libyan official said U.S. at fault in attacks, written by R. Hawkins, uh, 12 September 2012. He points out, that although the head of Libya's National Assembly has formally apologized for the killing of U.S. Ambassador Christopher Stevens, other high-ranking Libyan officials refused to apologize and continued to uh, contend the U.S. is to blame. The story talks about those contentions. Hey, it was our fault. Kind of like the ridiculous claims that sometimes those of us who are judges or prosecutors heard from a... Um, guilty rape defendant who said, well, you know, she was asking for it. Excuse me? That was abominable what happened at the Libyan embassy. And it is a tragic fact that this administration, against the will of Congress, without even asking what the will of Congress was, said, well, gee, you know, the UN Organization of Islamic Conference, they want us there, so... Why not? We ought to go. That's all he needed. He didn't care what Congress thought. He enabled them. He took out, he used American bombers. And then when the American public obviously was upset, eventually that it was taking so long, uh, hey, hey, keep in mind, it's not, it's not the U.S., it's NATO. He, he may not have gotten a briefing that let him know that over 60% of the NATO military is American military. And here's a flashback article. I just think it's important when these terrible things are happening around the world that we take a quick look at how we got where we are so maybe we don't keep doubling down on things that get Americans killed and hurt our national security. But uh, this article by Dana Loach, 12 September 2012, 
uh, flashback. Obama administration endorsed the Muslim Brotherhood. And it points out that uh, from a New York Times article, even August 1st this year, said uh, Leon Panetta, the United States Defense Secretary, said on Tuesday, President Mohamed Morsi of Egypt was his own man, a strong declaration of American support for Mr. Morsi, a former leader of the Muslim Brotherhood whose future course in Egypt remains a great unknown to the Obama administration. Well, it didn't keep us from enabling him to be there. Another article says Obama admits he lost Egypt as an American ally, and it goes on to talk about how the president, because of our turning our back or stabbing a, a man with whom this administration had made agreements, who was trying to uphold the Israeli-Egyptian accord as brokered by President Carter. One nice thing that President Carter did, President Obama now admits, well, they're not really an enemy, but they're not an ally. We lost them as an ally because of the incompetence of this administration. Obama declines meeting with Netanyahu, and let me just finish with this. Uh, the, although he doesn't have time for Netanyahu, he apparently has time to attend a Jay-Z's Beyonce fundraiser. Well, they're fabulous entertainers. I understand that. But there's a country to run. There are Americans being killed. And it's time somebody around this town picked up the responsibility and acted responsibly. I don't think doing a CR is the way to do it, but certainly not running off for fundraisers when people are giving their lives for you and foreign soil is a way to go either. With that, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Does the gentleman have a motion? Uh, Madam Speaker, then I move that we do not hereby adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the House stands adjourned until 9 a.m. tomorrow. Today, the House passed bills on 2013 federal spending and defense sequestration cuts. The federal spending measure lets agencies spend money for six months into the new budget year starting October 1st. And the defense sequestration bill would require the president to provide Congress with cuts to replace upcoming defense cuts set to expire in January. Tomorrow, the chamber gavels in at 9 a.m. Eastern for work on legislation that would prohibit the Energy Department from issuing loan guarantees for renewable energy projects submitted after 2011. Follow the House Live here on C-SPAN when members return. In three weeks, the first of the